Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Thanks, Amy. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see all of you. And uh, I really got a couple of special surprises this morning. And uh, this is no uh, criticism of anybody else's existence or place in my heart, but it was fantastic to see the uh, Hildebrands and the Woodworths here in service with us this morning, a couple of our missionary families that we've been supporting for many years. Great to see you guys. And I lost the Hildebrands. We already lost. Oh, there they are. Okay, good to see y'all. All right, well, uh, <clears throat> as you heard, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. So if you're not there in your Bibles, go ahead and turn your Bibles now. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the director of Connect and Grow Ministries here at Fellowship Bible Church. And if you're new to FBC and you don't know what Connect and Grow Ministries are, then uh, reach out to me and I'll try to explain it <laughs> as best I can. All right, well, we're going to be continuing our uh, Roman series called Live by Faith as we preach through the book of Romans, which uh, those of you who've been here all year know that it's, it's been taking up most of our year, but it is a, uh, it's been a glorious journey, I hope, for you guys as well. If uh, I already mentioned that, I have a note here to tell you to turn in your Bibles, but you did that already, didn't you? Thank you. Well done. Okay, so let's talk about mosaics for just a minute. Mosaic. A mosaic is a picture or pattern that's formed by arranging uh, small pieces of material, usually rock or glass or tile, into a larger pattern or picture <clears throat> designed by someone uh, to communicate something or, of course, just for beauty's sake. And in an ancient mosaic, such as the one that you see pictured, the individual pieces were either naturally occurring, uh, small pebbles and that kind of thing, or they were handmade. And what that meant was, even though some of the pieces in that picture look very, very similar, every piece was indeed a little bit different. Every piece was unique. They vary in size, shape, and color, but when they're assembled, they produce a beautiful picture according to a master design. Now, I realize that you guys have probably heard this analogy a hundred times, especially if you've been part of the church for years. And uh, the analogy, of course, is that the church is like a mosaic. So I know I'm not breaking any new ground in saying that. But the reason it's used so often is because it is such a wonderfully apt illustration. The church, the body of Christ, is a spiritual mosaic. Every local church is a group of people, all different, all unique, gathered to form something beautiful according to God's design. <clears throat> we are a mosaic, and not only because there's a lot of different backgrounds and personalities and, personalities and that kind of thing, but we're also a mosaic because God has given each of us different gifts. There's a variety and a difference of gifts between all of us that are then fit together by the design of God in order to produce this beautiful picture that we call the church. The, uh, the idea of spiritual gifts, gifts that the Spirit gives to you either by way of enhancing uh, natural talents or abilities that you have or by giving you just something completely supernatural is the topic that Paul is referring to in these six verses that we're looking at this morning. But before I look at the passage, I do want to say a few words about the context. In the previous two verses, as you'll remember, which was two weeks ago, our lead pastor Todd Malone preached on that and 
the Apostle Paul exhorted us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. These commands were given as a response to the mercies of God who saved us and forgave us and adopted us and loved us. Paul saying, God has done all these things for us. In the, in the previous 11 chapters, he talks about all of that. God has done all of these things for us. God has shown us immeasurable mercy. So in response to that, in light of the many mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice and be transformed by the renewal of your minds. So with these general commands in place, so he's kind of giving an overarching idea of living out the Christian life. Regularly presenting yourself as a living sacrifice being uh, transformed by the renewal of your mind. So now what he's going to do is turn to specific instances and show us this is how this looks in this area. This is what sacrificial living looks like here. This is what a renewed mind looks like here. And throughout the rest of the book, really, you're going to see examples from one uh, area to another of what this looks like. But one thing I want you to remember is that all of these instructions on how to think and live and speak follow your experience of the mercy of God. You don't live a godly life so that you can experience God's mercy. You live a godly life because you have experienced God's mercy, because you have been transformed by the Lord. When you trust in Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit, you're adopted into the family of God. You are now a beloved child of God, fully accepted because of the merits of Jesus Christ. Looking at that, the mercy and grace of God to undeserving sinners, now live out of this new status that you're enjoying as a child of God. You're going to hear some commands in this passage, and God's commands should be obeyed. We should hold God in the highest awe and reverence. We should live in the true and respectful fear of God. But I don't want anybody to get the idea that your pursuit of obedience to these commands earns or keeps your place in the, body of God, in the body of Christ. If you are a follower of Christ, your standing before God is completely based upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you see you're guilty of disobeying one of these commands, confess that to the Lord and receive his gracious forgiveness. Ask his help to pursue obedience out of your love and gratitude toward Christ. Okay, so let's look at the passage. Uh, Paul makes three primary points in this passage, and we'll just take them in order. The first point he makes is this. We should think of ourselves with humility. We should think of ourselves with humility. Look again with me at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith, that God has assigned. The verse begins with Paul's reminder of his position as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about when he says, the grace given to me. He brings this authoritative position into our view so we see, okay, this is something we ought to pay, pay attention to. This is something that we ought to listen to. But he does it in a way that is actually humble and gracious. For instance, Paul did not earn his apostleship. Paul did not achieve his apostleship. Paul did not become an apostle because he was deserving of becoming an apostle. Before he trusted in Christ, as you know, he was actually a uh, blasphemer and a persecutor of the church. And he was keenly aware of that, often referring to it in his letters. Now, Paul was a naturally brilliant man. Before he trusted in Christ, he was a rising star in Judaism. He was smart, strong, zealous, and capable. He had many natural gifts that later contributed to his tremendous leadership abilities in the early church. But that did not qualify him to be an apostle. Being an apostle was a grace that was given to him. His achievements didn't earn him a place among the apostles. It was purely on the free grace, free mercy, and free cho choice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was an apostle purely by God's grace. It was given to him. It was not bought or deserved by him. And the reason I want to harp on that is because that is a foreshadowing of what he's about to go into, that we should have that same attitude. The gifts that we have been given, we did not earn, we did not deserve, we did not achieve. They were given to us. And that's what leads into this idea of being humble in our uh, estimation of ourselves. 
So he says, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't be self-important. Don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. Now, why do you think that even needed to be said? I mean, are people naturally prone to arrogance? You can, anybody want to raise your hand? <laughs> Kidding. Of course, we all are, right? All of us are prone to be tempted to pride and arrogance. He's talking about the gifts. He's about to talk about the gifts that the Spirit gives to the members of the body of Christ. So he starts out with this warning not to think too highly of ourselves because in the exercise of our gifts, we are even more prone to the temptation of self-importance. Man, look at me. Look at me. One reason I think this warning is given since he's addressing the topic of spiritual gifts, if you have a gift that is very visible and public, you'll be tempted to think you're more important than others or that you're more favored than other believers. I must really be more gifted than the rest of the congregation because I get to preach the Sunday sermon, sermon nine times a year. I'm more important than most people at this church because I play guitar on the music team. I teach a kid's class every Sunday. I'm quite an impressive person. Now, none of us would verbalize those thoughts, but all of us are prone to going there with our attitudes. And I think we've all encountered believers, including ourselves, if we're honest, who have manifested an attitude of pride or self-importance in their dealings with other Christians. We think we're more important or more gifted than other believers. And he says, do not think too highly of yourselves, but think with sober judgment. What does that mean? Well, that final phrase in verse 3 kind of expounds that uh, idea of thinking with sober judgment. He adds, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Think of yourself according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. That phrase, measure of faith, could be understood as standard of faith. And I think Paul is saying that we regard ourselves by the standard of faith that God has assigned to us, meaning Christ himself. He is the measure, the standard of our faith. R. Kent Hughes says this, Paul is asking the believer to estimate himself according to his relationship to Christ. When one sees Christ is the standard of measurement, he will not think of himself more highly than he ought, but rather think of himself with sober judgment. We should think of ourselves with humility as we consider Christ. When you fix your thoughts on Jesus, you can't help but be humbled. Who could look with faith on the God-man, the Messiah, the Savior, and at the same time think highly of himself? Hebrews says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Who would dare to contemplate such a truth and then say, yeah, I'm pretty important too? By focusing your mind on the measure of faith, the standard of faith, which is Christ himself, you're getting the focus off of yourself and then getting a right valuation of where you stand in God's family, not above others. Think about his greatness and then think soberly about yourselves. And by the way, this does not mean that the Apostle Paul is saying we should constantly denigrate ourselves or think of ourselves as completely worthless. We think according to the measure of faith, Christ. Christ, the measure of faith, bought us with his blood and loves us with boundless love. We are his people, favored, accepted, and beloved. That is true for every believer, not just those who seem to have more abundant spiritual gifts or a more dynamic personality. Don't be arrogant. Don't be prideful. Be humble. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So when you see someone being put in a more public place, if you will, a public out front position. Do not think with envy on them or do not think that you therefore deserve it more or that they deserve it less than you. Instead, look to Christ. Think of his greatness and recognize he places people in the church the way that he chooses. Consider yourselves as spiritually impoverished people who were graciously saved and adopted by the great king of the universe. Be thankful for whatever gifts that God has given you, recognizing that it isn't because of your goodness, your merit, or your worth. So if the gifts that you have seem to be more humble or seem in your mind to be less important, recognize that even the gifts that, for instance, Todd Malone, our lead pastor, has, the most uh, public part of our church, you might say, 
He's not given those gifts because of his greatness. He's not given those gifts because of his goodness. He was given those gifts because of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and by the way, he is a humble man, so in case he's listening, I'm not accusing you of pride. The second point that Paul makes, in addition to thinking of ourselves with humility, is this. We are all one body in Christ, yet we have different roles. We are all one body in Christ, yet we have different roles. Look with me again at verses 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. In these verses, Paul compares the church to a physical body, as he does in, in other letters, notably 1 Corinthians. We have eyes, we have a mouth, we have hands, we have feet, etc. And all of our members have different, can see, but it can't feel. The hands can feel, but they can't hear, and so on. And in the same way, all of us who believe in Christ are one in the one body in Christ, and though many, we are joined to one another, yet we are also different. We also have different functions. We're all united to Christ, and because of that, we're all united to one another. We are bound together spiritually. He said, individually, you are members one of another. That means that we are interdependent. He's making the same point that he made in 1 Corinthians 12. The church is one body, and it's composed of many, many parts that have different roles. And because we're one body... Every part has an interest in the state of every other part. For instance, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Again, go back to the analogy of the physical body. If you have a backache, that is only one part of your body, but your whole body is suffering. You cannot separate yourself from your back and go, Okay, I'm going to let that suffer in isolation and the rest of me go about my business. And in the same way, if you are honored, for instance, you're, with your athletic prowess, your physical body doesn't get separated from your intellect to say, okay, my intellect didn't get honored. It was just my athleticism. No, your whole person was honored. So in the church, it's the same way. We should care as much about our brothers and sisters as we care about every part of our physical bodies. And without saying it here, the implication is, is the same. Every member... Of the body of Christ is necessary. Now Paul didn't say that in Romans 12 here. But it's a necessary implication. Every member is necessary. There is not one of you believers. Who is superfluous to this local body. Most of us have 10 fingers. And you, but you can get by with less. That doesn't mean that any of these 10 fingers are unnecessary. Most of us have two kidneys. You can live on one kidney, one kidney, but that doesn't mean that the other kidney is unnecessary. I realize that the analogy breaks down at some point, as all analogies do. Of course, it is possible for a human body to have unnecessary parts, but that is not true for the church. With regards to the church, this spiritual body that God has put together, every part is essential. Every believer is placed into the body of Christ by the good design of our sovereign God. No one is accidentally a part of the church. <clears throat> and when he mentioned in his analogy that the members of our physical bodies do not all have the same function. Once again he was highlighting the fact that our gifts are different. Our roles in the church are different. I don't have the same function as Alex Stanton in the body of Christ. Megan Turner doesn't have the same function as Lauren Gibson. There is a marvelous diversity of gifting in the church according to God's good design. And this diversity is brought about by our unity through our union with Christ. We're all one body in Christ, yet we have different roles. That also means, by the way, that we should give grace to those whose gifting is different from ours. And we feel like they go about things in a way that is uncomfortable for us. I don't mean sinful, but you know how... I'll just be honest here. I'm uh, vulnerable about myself. There, there are certain ways I think that uh, people should teach the Bible. And when somebody teaches, you're still bringing truth, and they teach it kind of in a way that feels like it's another path than I'm expecting, it kind of sets me off a little. I don't know if that's right. 
Uh, but, but of course, that's, that's my own sinfulness. They're going, okay, his gifting is different, and I shouldn't be bothered by the fact that he does things differently. I hope that's helpful. Uh, again, you, you may want to email Todd about my, <laughs> my heart issues. We're all one body in Christ, yet we have different roles. Okay, now the final point that he makes is this. We should use our different gifts for the strengthening of the body of Christ. We should use our different gifts for the strengthening of the body of Christ. So look at verses 6 through 8 with me. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, this sentence is actually very odd because uh, those of you who have uh, versions that italicize added words will notice that this, doesn't act this sentence doesn't actually have a verb. What he literally said was, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. That phrase, let us use them, was supplied by English translators to make the sentence complete and to make it more readable and understanding. But Paul just really left that kind of implied rather than stating it implicitly. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily important, but if you have an idea of why Paul did that, shoot me an email and I would be happy to entertain it. Obviously, he is getting at that point, though, from reading it, right, that we should use the gifts that God has given us. That's why it's not weird that they put in that phrase, let us use them. Verse 6 puts the gifts each of us have in the same category as the apostleship that Paul had, a gift of grace, something that is given to us, something that is not earned. Our gifts differ, he said, according to the grace given to us. The great English commentator Matthew Henry said this, the free grace of God is the spring and original of all. Right in, it's you humbly receive and rejoice in and be grateful for. The role of God's grace in the abilities that you have cannot be understated because you use them on your own. And that's true, of course, even for your you didn't earn them, you didn't buy them, and you couldn't produce them on your own. That we have all. Gifts. You know, like, let's go back to my uh, confession just a minute ago. If everybody did teach exactly the same way I taught, it would be a little bit boring, wouldn't it? Everybody would just sound the same. It would be a little bit robotic, maybe sound, t seem too uh, formal and uniform. Back to the mosaic idea. A mosaic that consists of lots of colors and shapes and images is much more visually interesting and exciting than the kind of mosaic that I would put together, which might just be all white squares. Look at the symmetry. They all match. It's just beautiful. <laughs> but it's not as beautiful in its diversity. <clears throat> Paul lists seven gifts in these verses that God gives believers, uh, but recognize that this is not a comprehensive list because other gifts, uh, because he mentions other gifts elsewhere. In fact, spiritual gifts are discussed in four different places in the New Testament. Here in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. And uh, one of the commentaries I read had this to say about that. A comparison of the gifts mentioned in each passage will illustrate the point that even by combining all four lists, and they had a great chart that I should have reproduced for you all, so my apologies. But even if you combine all four lists, the intent of Scripture is not to arrive at an airtight list. Rather, the lists indicate some of the ways the Holy Spirit manifests the grace of God in the church. And I think that is an excellent way to understand the matter. In today's text, Paul is just giving a sampling of the Spirit's gifts and exhorting us to use them. If you have one or more gifts that are not mentioned in the list, the principle is still the same. Use your gifts for the strengthening, strengthening of the body. This list of gifts follows Paul's statement that we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of another. And so that re-emphasizes the point that the Spirit gives us gifts 
in order to build up the body of Christ. Commentator J.A. Fitzmaier puts it this way, gifts have been given that with them Christians might serve one another. All charisms, which is a, a spiritual gift, all charisms are graces that move Christians to action on behalf of others. You all, all you believers, all you brothers and sisters in Christ, you all have gifts. Every child of God has been gifted by the Spirit, divinely enabled to contribute to the health and vitality of the church. So use those gifts to strengthen the body of Christ. I'm going to take just a few minutes and go through these gifts that Paul lists. Hopefully give you at least a better understanding of these seven gifts. The uh, first one that he mentions is prophecy. He says if prophecy, it should be exercised in proportion to our faith. Now prophecy, <clears throat> excuse me, is speaking God's to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. A New Testament prophet, like Old Testament prophets, was someone who spoke under direct divine inspiration. Their prophesy prophesying was to be, to be done in proportion to our faith or in relation to our faith. The prophet's message must conform to, again, the standard of faith, who is Christ, his character, his work, and his message. If a prophet exercised his or her gift in a way that glorified themselves, and glorified themselves, I got the emphasis wrong there. I'll start that sentence again. If a prophet exercised his or her gift in a way that glorified themselves, they were not prophesying in proportion to their faith. They may have been saying what was correct, but they were still not prophesying correctly. If a prophet mixed their own ideas with God's pure truth, they were not prophesying in proportion to our faith. Everything they said had to align with the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. Now, many Bible students understand prophets preaching as well, since a preacher is speaking God's message, or he really should be. It's no reason to stand up here otherwise, right? Now, I don't believe anyone alive today, and, and there's diversity, speaking of diversity, there's diversity of views on this, even within our body, and that, that's fine. I don't believe that anyone today has been given direct divine revelation like the biblical prophets. So I wouldn't be comfortable calling someone a prophet in the biblical sense. But I agree that biblical preaching necessarily has a prophetic element to it because the direct message of God is being communicated. So I'm okay saying that preachers and teachers of God's word are engaging in prophecy. I may add that to my business card. We'll see. But just as with the biblical prophets, when you do speak God's message, it should be done in alignment with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now after prophecy, Paul mentions service. If service in our serving. In other words, if you have the gift of service, you use that by serving people. It seems so straightforward, doesn't it? But then when you, you, you read it, you see it in black and white, it really adds something. Service refers to doing what serves or helps others. Uh, one writer defined it as this, an activity of a practical nature exerted in action not in words. So typically, you, when it's talking about the gift of serving, you're not talking about a speaking gift, but actually a, a doing gift, a more physical gift. <clears throat> Cleaning up trash in the sanctuary is serving. Helping someone clean up their yard after a storm is serving. Offering hand sanitizer to people as they enter on Sunday morning is serving. It's a physical activity where you are meeting someone else's need. If this is your gift, you exercise it by doing the things you're compelled to do. You bless and you strengthen the body of Christ by serving. By ministering in practical ways to the needs around you. After service he turns to teaching. The one who teaches in his teaching. Teaching is simply the communication of knowledge about God. Instruction about his character, his words and his will. And this gift of teaching is not limited to just formal teaching. Like is happening right now. Where I have a crowd in front of me and I have a prepared message that I'm bringing to you. <clears throat> teaching can and should be done <clears throat> whenever the opportunity presents itself. Dinner with a family in your small group, conversation while playing golf. Keep in mind, Jesus did a lot of his teaching of his disciples while they were just walking from one town to another. So teaching is something that can be done formally and informally. And a person with this gift has a powerful desire to both understand Scripture and to pass that understanding on to others. After teaching, he mentions exhorting, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. 
Exhortation has two aspects. For one, education is bring. I said education, didn't I? Exhortation. For one, exhortation is bringing comfort to those who are troubled or hurting, loving, lovingly bringing the Lord's truth to bear on their situation to give their spirit strength and peace. And let me say that does not mean simply uh, callously tossing a verse to someone who is going through a difficult time. Okay, that's why I added lovingly. It's lovingly bringing God's truth to bear. So when someone has just experienced a tragedy, they may not need to hear, even though it is true, they may not need to hear that all things work together for good. What they may need to hear is that God loves you and God is with you and God is here to help you. And he is even working through me. That would be bragging. When God's working through me to help you. Don't say that. Uh, I'm here for you on behalf of God, that kind of thing. So it's not just simply, hey man, buck up. You know, God's working all things for your good. It's doing what you can to strengthen or comfort someone that is going through a difficult time. The second aspect of exhortation <clears throat> is encouraging people to live as Jesus taught, to live in step with the gospel. This can involve confrontation, exposing deception or pride or some other sin. That doesn't mean that it needs to be angry, but exhortation of that kind must tackle sin head on and press the ensnared believer to repent. Again, that should be done lovingly, okay? It's not something that you <clears throat> do in a confrontational or angry manner. Uh, I think probably most of us have had experience with people who may have had this gift, but used it in a way that it felt more like a club than the uh, loving hand of Christ. <clears throat> Those who have this gift desire to help people through warning, advice, counsel, or encouragement. Then we come to giving. The one who contributes in generosity. As with most, all followers of Jesus are called to engage in it to some degree. I don't know if you've ever justified something in your own heart by saying, I guess I just don't have that gift. <laughs> That's another common human failing. Yeah, I know that person's in need and I can help them, but I don't have the gift of giving. So somebody else is going to need to come along and address that. <clears throat> so all Christians should be giving, of course, but he's referring to someone who has the gift of giving. So there is a uh, a deeper, more uh, a deeper, stronger motivation on, on the part of this person to give even to the point of hurting. They're more likely to give sacrificially. They're, they're more likely to give in a way that requires them to actually give something up. Paul wants those people to know that they should give in generosity or in simplicity. In other words, their motive for giving should be that person's good and the glory of God and not the accolades that might come for the generosity or the gratitude of the person that they're helping out. Uh, the poster children for this, of course, the, the perversion of this gift would be Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. They saw that Barnabas gave and he was really praised and everybody just thought he was a great guy. So they decided they would get in on some of that. So they sold some land, took some of the money and gave it and said, oh yeah, this man, we, just, we sold this land that we had Every penny were given to the church and just flat out lied about it. And of course, God uh, struck both of them dead. <clears throat> doesn't, that doesn't typically happen, I realize. Uh, but the point being that if your giving is of the wrong motivation, if you're giving in order to receive the praise of man, in order to receive the gratitude of the person giving according to the standard of Christ. <clears throat> in, fact, in fact, let me uh, touch on that, the gratitude aspect uh, again. One of the things that... Uh, I was confronted with several years ago, Adam McMahon and I were at a uh, conference in Austin, Texas. First time I had vegan ice cream. Wouldn't you know that would be in Austin, right? And uh, at this conference, the guy I was talking about, when you help somebody, basically this kind of thing, when you help someone, your motivation needs to be their good and the glory of God and not their thanks. Because our tendency is, man, I just helped this person who had a desperate need and they didn't even thank me. In fact, they were a little bit rude. The example that the uh, conference speaker gave was uh, he had met someone in a parking lot because they had needed a bed for their children. And he brought the bed there. And they didn't get, get, even get out of their car. They were like, ah, just loaded in the back. They didn't thank him. And so he was like, why did I just do that? I can't believe that person did that. And what he was convicted of is, okay, well, I didn't do that in order to get thanks. So whether I get thanks or not doesn't matter. So our giving should be 
with the correct motive. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The last gift mentioned in this passage is mercy. Wait a second, I skipped leadership. Let me go up one. Next on the list, gift number six, leadership, the one who leads with zeal. The gift of leadership enables a believer to oversee or superintend others. The most obvious place for this gift is among the elders, since they oversee the entire local church. But it's also exercised in every level of ministry in the church, kids ministry, youth ministry, the encore ministry to senior adults, and so on. The Lord encourages leaders to use their gift with zeal. Don't be half-hearted. Don't be uh, lazy or passive. Zealously, enthusiastically lead others to glorify God. Now the last gift. The last gift mentioned in this passage is mercy. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Mercy is kindness or concern that is shown for someone in need. If you have this gift, then you feel deep compassion when you see someone in need. And you have the urge... To help them in any way that you can. The gift of mercy moves a person to action. A kind word. A helping hand. Sharing material goods. Every believer again is called to show mercy. But those with a gift of mercy have a more powerful internal motivation to mercy. And Paul exhorts such people to do their acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Because much like giving... When you serve someone in mercy, when you're helping someone in need, there is going to be the tendency to think that you are owed gratitude or you are owed praise from your fellow believers. And he is saying, no, 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 go about exercising your gift with cheerfulness because God is working through you, because God is bringing about his good through you. Don't rely on the praise of others. Don't rely on others. God is telling us we shouldn't worry about that. You're fulfilling God's purpose for your gift, and it doesn't matter how the people you help respond. Putting these three points together gives us the main idea of these verses. Believers should humbly exercise their diverse gifts, their diverse spiritual gifts, for the good of the body of Christ. Don't be self-important. The gifts you have were graciously given to you by the Holy Spirit out of love for you and for the body of Christ. And he distributes the gifts as he wills. So be humble. And with an attitude of humility, use your gift. No matter how mundane or simple it may seem, your gift, just like you, are essential to the health and vitality of the body of Christ to which you belong. Look for opportunities to minister the greatness and love of God through your gifts. As you do, you'll be a blessing to the people of Christ, either by building up believers or being a channel of God's grace to unbelievers, which God uses to draw them to Christ. In closing, let me, uh, let's look at just a few ways that we can respond to this word from God. As with every week, one encouragement would be to rewrite this passage in your own, in your own words. Again, that just helps you to think about what it's really saying and dig it deeper into your spirit. Praise God for the gifts that he's given you. Thank him that he's enabled you to teach or serve or extend mercy or lead. These are precious abilities that show in yet another way how much love the Father has for you. Now, if you don't know what your gifts are, ask the Lord to show you. <clears throat> and I'll add to that that you can also reach out to the church leadership to get help with that because we're here to help every believer find their place in the body of Christ. Tell another believer how his or her gift has edified you. Every time I get the opportunity to preach, there are a number of people that talk to me afterwards and tell me either that they were blessed or how much they enjoyed it. And that's fantastic. And don't stop. <laughs> that's, that's a great encouragement to me. But I'm thinking also of the people who, again, who aren't visible on Sunday mornings at our gatherings. Uh, the people who do clean the, uh, clean the building. <clears throat> the people who keep the yard neat, uh, Mark Aran, who manages all of our facilities. <clears throat> and don't forget about the people whose gifts are exercised outside this Sunday morning gathering. You know, most ministry in any given church happens outside of this because this is, this is an hour to an hour and a half out of 168 hours. Most of your life is lived outside of this gathering. And so because of that, most believers are exercising their gifts outside of the gathering, or they should be, of course. 
So thank the person whose gift for encouragement has helped you persevere through hard times. Thank the person whose gift for exhortation has helped you confront and battle a sinful habit. Thank the person who is helping to uh, keep the nursery clean and safe, watching kids, uh, even if they're screaming or crying, still showing them love and being patient. Let us hope. <laughs> Just kidding. They are. Uh, <clears throat> thank God for the multitude and variety of gifts that God has given. And thank a brother or sister for exercising their gift. So I'll close this way. Every believer who has been bought with the blood of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, brought into union with all other believers, adopted for forever and given that eternal inheritance, every believer has also been gifted by the Holy Spirit. So find your gift and use your gift. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Mighty God, in the name of your great Son, Jesus, who alone is worthy, who alone is holy, who alone is perfect. In his name, we come to you and we lift up our hearts in gratitude and praise for bringing us together today, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for reminding us of your goodness and your grace and your salvation. And Lord, thank you for this word about the use of our gifts for the unity and the building up of the body of Christ. Fill our hearts, Lord, with love for you and love for our fellow believers. Use us to minister the person and presence of Christ to those around us. God, I ask for all of those who are watching online, for all of those who are able to gather here in person, I ask for a special measure of grace on each of them today. May you be honored and glorified, Lord, and may you bless every believer with the joy of your presence. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. God bless you.